Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of YouTube. Uh, today we're going to be doing a short, hopefully short, lecture about the history of microphones and how this relates to vocal production, guitar production, that kind of thing in the modern day and age. I think it's important to know something about different types of mics and how they work because that should help you choose the right microphone for the right application. Okay, so today I'm going to be starting from the 1920s and coming up to present day. Um, I'm using my iPad just so that I can check my notes and make sure that what I'm saying is accurate and not just a load of rubbish. I'll try not to kind of talk into the iPad too much, but I'll just keep referring back to it to make sure it's all okay. So we'll briefly talk about the 1920s and old, awful microphones. Um, I don't actually have one of these, they're called carbon microphones. Um, the reason I don't have one is they're awful. Uh, by modern standards, they're absolutely terrible. The noise floor is awful, the output's quiet, they sound tinny, they sound like... If you've ever seen any vintage kind of... This is the voice from the BBC. It's that kind of... That was the actual sound that came out of the microphone because the way it worked is it was little droplets of carbon in between two electro electrically charged plates so carbon isn't the best magnetic kind of source although funnily enough this was used in a miniaturized form in telephones for years and years and years all the way up to you know, the 80s and 90s you know you get those big handsets on telephones they're really hard to break and that's one of the good things about carbon mics is they were tough because the design was so simple but the sound was awful which really didn't help with landline telephones and how they sounded so bad up until recently. So one last thing to mention about those that's a nice historical note is that when they were designed there was an improved design called the transverse current carbon mic designed by a guy called George Neumann. I'm going to be referring to that name over and over and over today because Neumann was an absolute genius, pioneer in his field, and Neumann are one of the most well-respected microphone companies even now in 2016. And that's because their design philosophy, philosophies and principles were always cutting edge and technically still are. So, um, from the 20s with carbon mics, if you've ever seen the film The King's Speech, um, those kind of original mics in the early stuff, they were carbon mics. And that's why you get that old, oh, it sounds old, what we now relate to being old because the mics are that bad. But the next generation of microphones was ribbon microphones. And here is one of them. This is a modern version of a ribbon mic. This is an SC Electronics R1 ribbon. And this is a lot better than the old ones, but it works in exactly the same way. Now, a ribbon microphone, works it's a really thin strip usually of aluminium held really tight like a little ribbon in between two magnets and the whole thing is hooked up to a transformer and then hooked up to an output so it's a relatively simple design which makes them relatively easy to make um, the downside to the original ribbons was that because it's such a thin little piece of metal and in the 30s manufacturing wasn't that great all it takes is one little imperfection and the tension and the whole thing can just go bing and snap or the way that it's held in between two magnets uh, they're quite delicate so if you just blow on one the ribbon can stick to the magnet and there's no way of getting that back without destroying the magnet so you'd have to send it in for repair and literally just a blow on the element and that's that's broke so they're not the best for that this is a slightly more rugged version and uh, the ribbon inside has kind of got a zigzag in it so that they could crumple it up into a smaller space. Now, the thing about ribbon mics in modern production is that because it's such a simple design, uh, this moves very naturally and very freely, which means that the uh, pickup is very natural uh, because there's nothing holding this ribbon apart from just two points. 
so it's just it's natural but in the same way unless you really 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 crank it tight until the ribbon rips uh, you can't have too much high frequency going on but it's a very very gentle high frequency roll off which means this is great for things like guitar cabinets where we don't want too much of that ultra high end or drum room mics, it's one of my favourite things for that, where you want quite a natural kind of sound. And it takes EQ very well as well, because it's got a very natural kind of roll off and it's not got any kind of lumps and bumps in the EQ. It doesn't bring anything out that makes you go, oh, oh no, ah. So ribbon mics are uh, mostly historical, but I like to use them quite a lot now. And there are modern mics like SE's Rupert Neve, Ribbon, the r r one that can really do some high frequency stuff now because the design is so much more advanced than it used to be. So there are applications for ribbons these days. You won't see them out in the wild very often because they are still relatively delicate. Um, in the 30s as well, there were the first moving coil microphones, which we refer to as uh, dynamic mics, but they were very kind of clunky and very expensive and when the original, the BBC had the Marconi ribbon made and that cost £9 at the time, which in the 30s was, that's a lot of money. We're talking like three or four thousand pounds in modern day money. But uh, there was, let's have a look, the, uh, there was a Blumline dynamic moving coil mic which cost £40. So that's like a remortgage. And when the BBC were buying hundreds of these things, they went, you know what, £3,000 each or lots and lots and lots, you know, £9 in that money against 40 It's like, we'll go with the cheaper one. It was still, still good quality, but the difference wasn't four times as good. So that's what they went with. Um, on a historical note, RCA were making better ribbons in America, but trying to import them cost an absolute arm and a leg. So that just didn't happen for the BBC. Now, as well as those, the very first condenser microphones were made in the 30s. And those are the ones that you'll see that look kind of like a big tube with a big silver disc in. But they were really unreliable in the 30s and 20s. And the tubes, if there was even a slight bit of moisture in the air, could pick it up and they'd be kind of popping and crackling. And it'd sound like a frying pan. It would sound like kind of someone had put Rice Krispies on the recording, which is bad enough when the, the tape's low quality or the radio broadcast isn't the best, but no, it, it's just so temperamental and unreliable. They weren't usable until the late 40s. I think it was 1949, because World War II really kind of screwed up the whole thing in terms of development. But then after World War II, ribbons got better magnets because better magnets came along and so did dynamics, and we'll come back onto that in a minute. But then also, we got this beast. This is roughly based on one of the first large diaphragm condensers. This is an SE Gemini 2, and it's not exactly the same, but this is kind of analogous, roughly, to a Neumann U47, which any audio engineer who's been around a while will as soon as you say Neumann U47, their eyes will go like, oh, because they are the gold standard in terms of kind of vintage sound in recording. This thing weighs an absolute ton, and as you can see, it's plugged in to its own cable, and its own cable goes to, oh, goes to this monster. This is the power supply for this microphone, because the way that large diaphragm condensers worked the impedance coming off this finely tuned capsule that was sprayed with gold, like really, really thin gold um, is the pickup, was way too quiet and completely the wrong type of signal to go into a traditional mixing desk. So it had to be powered separately from one of these before it even went to the preamplifier, which means you couldn't take it out of the studio for a start because you needed to be near a main socket. It was an absolute monster and you just had no option. I'll just briefly show you the inside of this thing where the ribbon that I've described had one piece of metal between two magnets strapped to a transformer and out. This, on the other hand, if it'll ever come out of its massive shock mount, is much, much, much more complicated. This thing 
is an absolute monster. Look at all those resistors and capacitors and other weird things. And on the other side, in here we've got two tubes. The original U47 had one big fat tube in it and a transformer, but this is a slightly different design. But you can see how there's all these things that could get broken, bashed, could go bang. So these type of microphones were absolutely great inside a recording studio where it was a kind of a safe environment. And to the point where Frank Sinatra of all, um, the, the well-known users of a U47 would not record at one point apparently um, without a U47, he insisted on it because the sound that these type of microphones can give when you get up close is quite warm, but also quite present. And it's got that kind of, what we still associate with a radio quality to it. The downsides being that it's bulky, um, you need to keep it uh, in good condition and keeping one of these repaired because it's so complicated can be quite expensive. If you can find a U47 these days, you might be looking at 30 or 40 thousand dollars or pounds lot of money. So whilst they were great in the studio, they weren't very good out in the live environment, which is where fast forward a little to the early 50s. So in the early 50s, um, companies like Shaw were trying to come up with dynamic mics that were a lot smaller, easier to hold, and could work outside of a big controlled recording studio environment. So they came up with the Unidyne capsule, which was in that big silver microphone, the Super 55 that you'll have seen Elvis use, the fat boy as they call it. And that later developed into the good old Shure SM57. In this thing's uh, seen some wars. And the SM58, which is exactly the same microphone really, apart from the grill. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. These are almost identical, but the Unidyne capsule has holes in it in such a way that before this, dynamic mics had what they call an omnidirectional pickup pattern where they take sound in from, from everywhere. So if you're stood in the middle of a stage, the speakers would be firing at the microphone and you'd get a lot of feedback very quickly. So you couldn't really turn up the microphones very loud, which is a problem, which is why early early shows, early gigs didn't have that much volume. But with this new cardioid dynamic design where it rejected sound from the back and only really brought sound in from the front. You could have the singer right in front of it and then keep turning it up and up and up and it would just blast more noise out at the audience and not cause horrible howling noises, which is good for everyone involved. There are loads of different designs of dynamic mic, like yeah, the Sennheiser 421 is another of my favorites. This is a slightly different, bigger design, but hey, there's so many different variations. A modern one, something like the Ardix i5, which is one of my favorites. But the dynamic world, you'll see a lot of uh, singers in the 70s and 80s holding onto these in things like Top of the Pops, because they were very practical. You could grab one, and I, compared to something like a Neumann U47, which has all those big fragile components, this has one big block of a magnet inside an electro. Well, yeah, so a moving magnet, a moving coil, moving coil, that's the one, and a transformer in. And it's so much more robust that I can just do this. And it's fine. I know it's fine because these are tough little cookies. <laughs> And that is why they've been so successful in the live environment. And one problem with tuning a dynamic mic with all these holes in to reject things is that the frequency response becomes quite bumpy, which means that there are some bass frequencies, mid frequencies that really stick out and others that don't. I mean, in the 70s, that was less of a concern than just having a microphone that didn't feed back uh, as much and didn't break when you dropped it first time. But the more we get into modern sound, the more we realize that, although that was great at the time, we can harness that now if we choose, or we can go a very different way. But that's where some, say, guitarists will use an SM57 and swear by it in front of a guitar cabinet, because those little frequency peaks and dips can make a guitar sound quite kind of clear and aggressive, and a lot of guys just like that sound. 
Personally, I'm not the biggest fan of the SM57 because I understand where we've gone with microphones, but I'll still quite often use one complemented by another mic because they are ubiquitous with the modern guitar sound. They just sound like people expect a guitar to sound. Now, moving on from that, because dynamic mics don't need power, ribbon mics don't need power, a large diaphragm condensers needed to be strapped to a main socket. So what about if you want that kind of condenser quality sound, which is that nice clear sound, but you can't be plugging somebody into the mains? Enter the small diaphragm condenser that's loosely based on something like the Neumann, Neumann again, KM84. I don't have a KM84, but I do have this SE5. And if you look at this, this is an SE5. And this is the entire microphone. This is the entire thing. So the circuitry is in here, but the KM84 was the first phantom powered microphone available that I know of in the mid sixties. And that meant that that could be powered uh, straight from the mixing desk through one cable. So you could pick it up, you could put it wherever you wanted and just run a single lightweight cable back to the mixing desk and the power would come up the cable. The sound would go back down the same one and you got this really clear, crystal clear kind of accurate sound. Now I like to use these as drum overheads. I quite often like to use them doubled with something like an SM57 to give a real clarity to a guitar. Um, I don't tend to use them on vocals because they're almost too realistic. They're so brutally honest. I actually want to kind of warm a vocal up a bit. So that's where, moving on from the small diaphragm condenser being phantom powered, uh, Neumann looked at this and went, well, if we can phantom power this, why don't we try that with the bigger diaphragm microphones? And that's where something like this comes in. This is what most people associate now with a studio microphone. This is a phantom powered large diaphragm condenser, a lot like the flagship, the Neumann U87, which was Neumann's first attempt at a large diaphragm condenser that didn't need mains power. And that was such a big hit that we still use them today. I'm still considering buying one. And because the name factor goes with the quality, unlike things like cars where you can say, oh, this brand's good because of the name, this brand's good because of the name. Uh, Neumann really do make good quality microphones. They just always have done because they've strived for that. And that's where the circuitry in this, if I pull the bottom off, is probably a little simpler than the tube microphone because the FET transistor, like this little black thing in here, is a design that came in that completely replaced tubes in the 60s and 70s. And designers to a large part went, well, if we don't need tubes anymore, because a lot of factories weren't making them anymore and the prices were shooting up. But well, if, if we don't need it, let's just not, let's just not bother. And that's where the, uh, powered large diaphragm condenser came from. So we're almost at modern day now because that's in the late 60s and there haven't been that many advancements. Uh, one advancement is this beast. If you've ever seen one of these on a film set, because this is more TV and film, this is a shotgun microphone, also known as an interference tube mic. This is a Sennheiser MKH416. And this one runs off an old German style called T-Power, but most of them run off Phantom Power. And what it is, this is a lot like that small diaphragm condenser that I showed you before, but it stops kind of here. And this weird looking tube at the end, if I look, if the sound comes right down the tube, it hits the capsule perfectly. But if the sound comes in the sides, it kind of rattles around and becomes diffuse and cancels out, which means this is a very, very directional microphone and will pretty much only pick up what I am exactly pointing at, which is great for film because that means they can put it over an actor and point it right at them and only just pick up other actors, background noises. This can really cut out a lot of the noise and a lot of the, the awful stuff. I don't often use these in the studio. Sometimes I'll try it just for a bit of variation 
but I use this on shoots if I go out and I'm filming in a noisy environment. These will cancel out so much. The other type, which is mostly used for filming, uh, unless you're a big fan of something like DPA microphones, is the very final piece of widely used microphone technology, which is this thing that I'm wearing right here. This is a back electret microphone, and this is an absolute genius piece of design because it doesn't technically need to be powered. I think it needs a couple of volts and a tiny little something plug-in power just to make it all run properly. Let's just check them still, yep. Yeah. And the, it's tiny, but the way that it works is instead of having to put an electrical charge through the uh, capsule to kind of charge it to make it work, which is how condensers work, it's been pre-charged, so it already when I plug it in, doesn't need a lot of voltage to make it work. I think it needs a tiny bit of something as a, a preamp, but that's it. And that makes them nice and simple, which is why I'm wearing one and not using like a big uh, shotgun mic, which could fall on my head, <laughs> especially as a small filming crew where there's only one person and I'm not moving. And this is the kind of shot where it's completely okay to have one of these on. It's not like a drama film where it has to be no microphones in shot. They work perfectly well. I mean, if I put this in front of a guitar cabinet, it'd probably sound awful. I mean, I have to use quite a lot of EQ on the videos in the kind of muddy 500 hertz region. I'll lift the treble so you can hear what I'm doing. It doesn't kind of sound like this, but it's a quite practical thing for filming where it doesn't really work in a studio. Hopefully I've covered everything because there are some emerging technologies coming out, but I don't think they're quite there yet in terms of widespread affordable use. Um, if there's anything you think I've missed, let me know in the comments. Um, if there's any questions you have about anything in particular, just ask away. Um, if there are any videos like this that you'd like to see, again, just leave that in the comments below. Uh, thanks for watching. Uh, hit the like button. If you've not already subscribed, please do. It really helps my channel out. And uh, I'm Adam Steele for the Hot Pole Studios. Thanks for watching.